for Jesus, oh my brother, his disciple ever be. Render not to any other what alone the Lord should be. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give that you're here. Uh, we'll be talking about Gideon again this morning, and today we're going to be talking about faith. Uh, so uh, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Those that, uh, that are sick that we need to remember this week in our prayers, Lex Kane is in the local hospital. Jim Wilson is also in the local hospital. Uh, we need to remember them. Plus, we have a whole list of other folks that, uh, that uh, have been in and out of the hospital. John Roten is at home following surgery, Harold Eaton, Lloyd Beard, uh, Gerald Gray, all of these have had surgery recently. We're glad to see uh, Eddie Mooney is up doing, doing well, but uh, he's still moving kind of slow. Uh, Adrian Edge, if you, you see him back there in the back, he just, but he's still here, uh, so we, we, we're glad that he's able to get around. Uh, we also need to remember uh, Sheila Parsons, uh, Woodrow and Dale Brown, Cindy Chase, uh, and and others of our number that are that are sick. This is going to be a very very busy week. If uh, if you're here to take uh, take in all of the activities we got going on, uh, starts out Tuesday. Golden Circle will be having their month, monthly luncheon in the annex. Uh, Will Colmeyer from WTVA fame and also is a, uh, in charge of community relations at Northeast will be our speaker uh, at this meeting. Uh, Golden Circle will be taking a trip to the Ames Plantation uh, Festival. That's on Saturday. Uh, so there's a list out there to sign up for that. Also the sixth grade and below will be uh, going on a trip to the pumpkin patch on Saturday also. Uh, so there's information about that. So we have a lot of things that are going on this week. We need to remember uh, J.T. Beard. He's down in Guyana uh, for the next week or so. Uh, need to remember him. And also Greg and uh, Sarah Pollock. They're in Thailand. Uh, they'll be there till till next Monday, I believe, when they come back. So we have a lot of folks that are out that are, that are going places, working on mission trips, so we need to remember them. We also need to remember all of those folks that, that are affected by the hurricane that came through uh, last night and moving through uh, Alabama now. So we need to remember all of those folks. So we have a lot of things that we need to remember. So, and I hope we will do that this week. Today we'll be looking at Judges chapter 7, uh, and uh, we'll, like I said before, we'll be talking about faith. Uh, what kind of faith do we have? Do we have the same kind of faith that, that Gideon had uh, when he was put to the test? And how do we react when we are put to the test with our faith? Uh, 
When you look at Hebrews chapter 11, one of the people that you see there is Moses. And on our sheet, the very first thing it says in Hebrews 11, Moses was a man of faith who was able to see the invisible, choose the imperishable, and do the impossible. And I want you to think about Moses with me for just a minute. Moses was one man. God sent him on a mission. He didn't have an army. He didn't have a government behind him. One man. And God said, I want you to go down to Egypt and bring my people out. Can you imagine how much faith that took for that one man, Moses, to leave where he was and go down to Egypt? You know, some have estimated it was over two million people in Egypt that were slaves. But here was one man that had a mission. And it says that Moses could see the invisible. He could see what God was wanting him to do. And you know, if we could explain how he did it, you'd have to leave God out of it. But you cannot explain it because it was a step of faith. And that's the kind of faith that God calls us to today. Uh, And and you know, the, the, the same kind of faith that Moses had century ago we can still have today. We can still see the invisible, see things that other people can't see, things that can be accomplished (coughs) with God's help. And if you could explain it, it's not faith. You just have to to, uh, go through it. You know, Christians either are overcomers because of their un- overcome because of their unbelief, or overcomers because of their faith. We can overcome tremendous obstacles if we have faith. Uh, and today we want to look at Gideon. Uh, when when we first saw Gideon uh, last week, he was hiding in a wine press. But today, when we're talking about chapter 7, we're talking about a story of faith in action. That his faith moved him to do something. When we look at chapter 7, there are three principles of faith that are involved in this chapter that led Gideon to move from being a coward to being a conqueror. The very first principle of faith is that God tests our faith. God is going to test the faith that we have. You know, faith that that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. You have to be able to, God will test your faith. And God will give you things to do that's going to test your faith. And that, uh, that, that God wants our faith to be tested. I remember several years ago there was a story going around about a, a, a group of men that were on a, a, a board of a, of a mission uh, uh, organization. And one of the members of that board says, we have to just step out in faith. And another one says, whose faith? Sometimes we ask, whose faith are we, are we stepping out on? You know, sometimes we sing the song, Faith of Our Fathers. But you know, you cannot live on the faith of other people. You have to develop that faith for yourself. We can follow the example of folks that have stepped out in faith. But sometime in our life, we have to develop our own faith. We have to develop our faith that God is going to do what He said He said he would do, and he's going to help us to do the, those things. Someone who says that, that everybody, uh, faith is like a toothbrush. Everybody should have one and use it regularly. But it isn't safe to use somebody else's. We have to have our own faith. We can look at the, at the faith of others that have gone before us. 
but we have to develop our own faith. God tests our faith for two reasons. First, he wants to, sh to, to show us whether our faith is real or if it's counterfeit. Do we have real faith? The second reason uh, is, is that uh, to strengthen our faith for the task that he's going to set before us. God has a mission for us. And God has to have folks that are faith, uh, people of faith, someone that's willing to step out and do it. You know, God promises, uh, makes promises to us. But if our faith is not tested, we're not able to, to fulfill the work that God wants us to do. So let's look at Gideon this morning. The very first sifting, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were, with, who were with him rose early and encamped beside the wall of Herod. So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. If Gideon had put his faith in the army, where would his faith be? When he looked out there and said, if you're, if you're afraid or fearful, you just go on home. And 22,000 of his people left. If Gideon's faith was in that army, he had no faith left, did he? Because... Two-thirds of his army left him. And he was, he was there with just a few people. <clears throat> and we'll see later in the same reading where his army was reduced from uh, 10,000 to 300. If his faith was in the army, <clears throat> then his faith would be gone by this time. Less than 1% of the original 32,000 would be left to fight the Midianites. Less than 1%. You know, during World War II, uh, during the battle over, over London, Winston Churchill said concerning the Royal Air Force, that never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Less than 1% of his 32,000 men were going to be left there. And you know, Gideon was told why. Gideon said, I don't want these soldiers to go out and to boast about what they have done. I want them to, to glory in God. Like I said before, if you can explain it, then God didn't do it. But here we see that God did a tremendous thing. And He only used 300 people. You know, often we think about King Uzziah where it says in, in Second Chronicles that God had done marvelous things to lift him up, to build him up, to make him strong. But then, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Sometimes we have too much pride in ourselves, and not in what God had done. You know, in telling the fearful soldiers to return, uh, is similar to what Moses had told the fearful before. Uh, God wants folks that have the faith to know that he's going to take care of them. 
and you don't have to be able to explain. You know, pride after the battle robs God of glory, uh, and fear during the battle uh, robs God's soldiers of courage. One person that's fearful can do more damage to an army than a whole company of enemy soldiers. God wants people of courage. He wants people of faith to step out. And then we have the second set, uh, sifting, verses 4 through 8. <clears throat> but the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that those whom I say to you, <clears throat> This one shall go with you. The same shall go with you and whomever I say to you. This one shall go with you. So he brought the, the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart, from, uh, set apart by himself. Likewise, anyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lap, putting their hands to their mouth, were 300 men. But all of the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to, to Gideon, By the three hundred men who lapped, I will, sa uh, will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions, their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all of the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those three hundred men. Now the camp of Midian was below them in the valley. God had a second sifting. And the second sifting was that of the 10,000 that were left, he put them to the test. You know, we never know when we're being tested. These men didn't know that they were being tested. I heard the story of a of a, of, a, of a preacher when the congregation where he was working was looking at hiring an additional person to be part of their, their ministerial staff that he would always want to go and ride in the vehicle of the person they were con considering. You know, and he would look and see if it was neat, if it was clean, if he drove safely. You know, those things probably didn't have a whole lot of, uh, uh, of meaning to how well he would perform. But it points out that you never know when you're being tested. Here were 10,000 men coming down to the river to take a drink. They didn't know they were being tested. And you know, we can, we can get into a lot of uh, speculation as to uh, how, uh, why God was doing this. But we know that, that he had a purpose for it, and he was testing them. It's been said that make every occasion a great occasion, for you never know when somebody may be taking your measure for a larger place. God was measuring the army. And as they came to drink, and you have to assume that they were coming in groups, you know, because if you had, had 10,000 folks coming at one time, uh, you couldn't tell who was doing what. But evidently they were coming in, in uh, groups, and Gideon was able to look and see what each man was doing. And those that got down on their hands and knees and... and, and, and drank the water. God didn't use those. He sent them home. Those that would reach down and pick up a handful of water and lap it, those were the ones that he wanted to use. You know, the scriptures doesn't tell us why. Uh, it doesn't say uh, what God's reasoning was. You know, we can speculate. We can say that those that, that uh, got out on all fours were 
were, were not as uh, vigilant as the, the others. And that may be true. But the one thing that we can take from this is that God had a reason. These men didn't know they were being tested, but God knew that he was, who he was going to pick. And he was only going to take 300 of them. And God took the 300 that reached their hand down into the water and brought it up to their mouth. But the scriptures didn't tell us why. You know, he chose a, a method of testing them that was very unassuming. You know, as if you were there, you probably wouldn't even know what, how you were being tested. But God had a purpose, and he was testing them. You know, Gideon, uh, God was gracious. God, God was gracious to give Gideon so many signs. We've already, in, life, in the last chapter, we had the sign of the, the fire that came out of the rock. We had the, the dry fleece and the wet fleece. God was continually giving Gideon signs because Gideon was still developing. And by the 300, uh, uh, verse 7 gives us another one of those uh, promises. It says, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. God has promised him again, there in verse 7, that he was going to, to deliver the Midianites to him. The soldiers who departed left some of their equipment with them. They left uh, a trumpet for each person. They left a, a pitcher for each person. They left a torch. You know, these were strange weapons to leave for an army. If we were to look at that, we would say, that's not much to fight with, is it? Strange weapons indeed. You can't explain it, can you? Because God doesn't want you to explain it. He just wants you to do what he says he wants you to do. A second uh, principle of faith that Gideon uh, was was learning here is that God encourages our faith. The Lord wanted Gideon and his 300 men to attack the, the army that night. He wanted them to, to go ahead and do it. But he knew he had to deal with, with Gideon and his faith. He still had to, to reass, uh, reassure him again. You know, isn't it, isn't it good that God is willing to continually give signs, to give, uh, to give Gideon signs, even though he, he was, was doubting? And God understands us sometimes. Sometimes when we, we don't really know what to do, and we're looking for, for guidance, isn't it good that God will still have patience with us and be willing to help us to grow? God encouraged Gideon's faith in two ways. First of all, he gave him another promise. In verse 9 it says, And it happened that same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. I've given you the camp. You go down there and you look for yourself. You know, that's going to take a lot of courage. But God was telling Gideon, even though the battle hadn't been fought, I've delivered them to you. Even though you haven't even started the battle, you're going to win. And not only that, it would give them confidence that God was going to be with them. Sometimes we look at people of faith that, that they may have something like an, uh, uh, a religious arrogance in them, 
But when we're walking by faith, we can do great things. And we're humbled because we see the great power of God. And when folks are accomplishing great things for God, when you talk with them, they'll say, He did it. I didn't do it. God did it. And this is the case with Gideon. God is going to do this. He's not going to do it by himself, that God is going to do it. Because you can't explain 300 men defeating an army of 135,000. No way to explain it, except to say that God did it. The second thing uh, uh, is that uh, God gave uh, Gideon another sign. Let's look at verses 10 through 14. <clears throat> but if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with uh, Hira, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your, your word shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as the sands of the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it, so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. And to, the, and to his hands God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. God gave him another sign. You know, it took courage for Gideon to get up and to go down to, that, uh, to the camp of the Midianites. It took courage for him to go. But he went, and he took his servant with him. And when he came close to the camp, God allowed him to hear, hear a dream that one of the men, one of the soldiers had had. And it was a dream of a, of a barley loaf of bread that rolled down the hill and hit a tent, the tent collapsed. And he gave an interpretation. He said, this is the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash. They knew who Gideon was. They probably knew the strength of his army. Can you imagine if they knew all of this and they saw that, that most of his 10,000 men had left and he had only 300 left, that the Midianites, they were either saying he's got another plan or he's fixing to leave. The Midianites would think that they had won a great battle without doing anything. But God had a different purpose. God had something else in mind. You know, one of the ways that God communicated to people through the, uh, through the Old Testament and some in the New Testament was by dreams. And we have several examples of people that had dreams through the, through the years. We know that God communicated to Jacob and to Joseph and to Solomon and Daniel. Uh, Joseph, the husband of Mary, he communicated to them through dreams. And we know that sometimes he communicated to unbelievers through dreams also, like this soldier. He didn't realize that he was receiving a communication from God, but he was. For some that have received communication, uh, Nebuchadnezzar received a dream. Uh, Joseph's uh, fellow prisoners, uh, when he was in jail in Egypt, they had dreams. Pharaoh had a dream, and even in the New Testament, Pilate's wife had a dream. But it, 
But through dreams is not the primary way that God communicates to us. Because dreams can deceive you. You know, I, I wonder, I know the dreams I had would probably not be considered as a message from God and the dreams that you have. What's the best way to receive the message from God? Isn't it to, to take your Bible and to read it and study God's Word? That's how we get our dreams. But this soldier's dream was like a barley loaf. You know, barley loaf was the, was the grain of the, the poor people. And it may have been kind of humiliating to get in to, to be compared to a barley loaf but it didn't seem to bother Gideon because uh, of the significance of the fact that it said that God was going to deliver them. He was reassured by an enemy soldier who had seen a dream that had planted it in his mind by God. You know, that enemy soldier probably didn't have any idea he was communicating a, a message from God to Gideon, but he was. Look at verse 15, the first half of it. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. The very first thing that Gideon did at, at hearing the dream was to worship God. You know, before Joshua crossed over and, and uh, uh, defeated Jericho, the Bible says that he wor worshiped. And it's not a, a thing that we should take lightly because we ought to worship God before we attempt to do great things. Before we can be a successful warrior, we must first become a sincere worshiper. We need to worship God because He is God. The third principle that we want to look at this morning is that God honors our faith. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Faith doesn't mean just trusting God. It means using your faith to do something. Putting that faith into action. And that's what Gideon did here in chapter 7. He took the faith that had been growing in him and he put it into action. But how does he reveal the... the uh, how does he reward Gideon's faith? First of all, God gave him wisdom to prepare... Uh, to prepare an army. Second half of verse 15, it says that he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hands. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet into every man's hand uh, with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, Look at me, and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. And when I blow the trumpet, I and I and all of uh, who are with me, then you also blow the trumpet on every side of the whole camp and say, The sword of the Lord and Gideon. God gave him wisdom. When Gideon came up from the camp. He was a new man. He was, he was a kind of person that was ready to go at that point. That his life had been changed. Notice he, that he announced to his men there in verse 15. He said, the Lord has given them to us. Here was a man that could see the invisible. He could see a victory already coming. And he could, could do the impossible. He was going to win a battle against a, a great host with 
weapons that we would never consider. He could see the invisible and do the impossible. That was because of the, the faith that, uh, that God had put in him. Gideon's plan was simple. You take your torch and you put it in your pitcher and you take your ram's horn, go around the, the entire camp on the hills above them, and you do like I do. And you shout when you break that pitcher, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. Notice verse uh, 17 where it talks about Gideon. You know, when we first saw Gideon, he was questioning, questioning God. But here he says, you watch me. You follow my lead. Do exactly as I do. He had come a long way from the first time that God had encountered Gideon, hadn't he? He had become a leader. Uh, and, and he no longer needed signs because God had given him enough signs and he was ready to go. God can take a doubter like Gideon and turn him into a general. And God did it. God gave him the courage to lead the, lead the army. Verse 19, So Gideon and the, and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted, posted the watch. And they blew the trumpet and broke the pitchers uh, that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hand and the trumpet in the right hand for blowing, and they cried the sword of the Lord in Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the three hundred blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled. Notice that Gideon told them, you do what I do, and they did. And when Gideon gave the signal, they cried out, they blew their trumpets, and they broke their pitchers, and the lights came on around, all around the, the Midianite camp. But notice in verse 22, it says, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion. Who caused the confusion? I'm sure the bright lights on the, all, all around them, the sound of the trumpets had something to do with it. But God caused the confusion and they began to kill each other. And after, they, after a few minutes of that, they began to, to, to leave, to flee. Here was a great army that was in retreat. They were afraid because God had planted a seed of confusion in that army. Gideon didn't have to do anything. God did it all. All he had to do was obey. God gave him the opportunity to enlarge his army, verses 23 through 25. Then the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all the all Manassas and pursued the Midianites. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites. And they arose and, and went to the watering place at Beth Barah and the Jordan. And all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering holes of Beth Barah and the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of the Midianites, Orb and Zeb. And they killed Orb at the rock of Orb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Orb and Zeb to, to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Notice that his army had increased very quickly. It would be hard for an army of 300 to pursue a, a huge army like the Midianites. So he sent messengers out to the other tribes, to Naphtali, Asher, uh, and 
uh, Manassas. I'm sure a lot of those that came were part of that 32,000 that had come out before. But notice that even the tribe of Ephraim sent people to, to, uh, to block off the retreat at the Jordan River. And they were given the privilege of uh, capturing the two princes of Midian. Orb and Zeb, and they killed them and brought the heads to, uh, to Gideon. You know, God doesn't need large numbers to accomplish His purpose. But He did, and He doesn't need especially talented people to do the, the things that He wants to get done. But God wants people that are available people of faith. We can be comfortable in our, in our big congregations, our big budgets, and big crowds, but sometimes it misplaces the faith that we ought to be developing in ourselves. You know, God blesses His leaders when they walk by faith and not by sight. The important thing for us to remember is that we need to be available. We need to be available for God when He has a job for us to do. You know, we may not understand His plans, but we need to be able to trust fully that He will fulfill the promises that He makes to us and that in faith He's going to give us a victory. I hope we can remember the three principles of faith that's found here in chapter 7. That God is going to test our faith. That God is going to encourage our faith. And that God honors our faith. Our time is up. Thank you for being here with us today. We have one more lesson on Gideon.